that, I have something to show you guys. So, yeah, let's take a moment and appreciate these little gems. Um, as I was putting these pictures up there, I couldn't help but put my own little baby up there. So, that's, oh, no. On the bottom right hand corner, that's my baby, Willow. So, as a child, I've always had pets when I was younger. I've had a lot of them. I've had fishes, turtles, hamsters, hamster babies, dogs, bunnies, and currently I have cats. And I loved them like every other kid, but as I grew older, I realized that my love for them turned to a passion. And that's why I chose to intern at an animal clinic because I always thought that it would be awesome if I could be a doctor and help them. But before I get started on my experience at the clinic, I want to talk about how I got my internship. So three weeks before the interns were supposed to go out, my internship site, the person, my supervisor dropped me and told me that sorry, um, your internship is no longer available. So, three weeks before we started, I had no internship. But I persisted. I learned the lesson of persistence. And I realized that I could either go back to my classes, like the rest of the kids, or I could find a new one. And this is what persistent looked like, my version at least. I was contacting about 10 clinics at the same time, and I went through like four or five more versions of these lists. And these are basically what I had to do. I had to call them, I had to go visit clinics, etc. And my hard work prevailed, and I got an internship at BCA Brookline. So, on the first day, I had no clue what was installed for me. And the slow puppy, she just got out of surgery that day, and we had to send her home with a cast. And originally, we put the yellow cast on, like you can see, but we were just talking about how ugly it is, and we're like, you know what, let's turn it into a minion. And everyone at the clinic contributed to it. And everyone at the <coughs> clinic, even though it was my first day, they were super welcoming, they were super nice, and they asked me to contribute to this piece of art. And I made those little black buttons up there, that's me, but everyone else made a little different part of it. And in the end, the owner loved it, and I think everyone else loved it too. So when I first started at the clinic, I did some basic tasks, like cleaning the cages, sanitizing it, and restocking the shelves, like the needles and stuff, basically just easy tasks for me to get around the clinic and get to know it better. There was a lot of play at the clinic, like on the left side. So the white dog that I was holding is named Teddy. He's like old and pudgy. And on my, the other dog, the golden one, her name's Rosie, and she was going to get spaded. She was young and energetic, and those dogs belonged to one owner. So it was really fun playing with them. Um, Teddy is like old and slow, and when I walk them, Rosie's al al always the one that's like running ahead, charging, and Teddy's like waddling beside me. They're so cute. I miss them so much. And Rosie's always trying to jump on Teddy and be like, play with me. And then Teddy's just like, no, let me be old. <laughs> so cute. I miss them so much. Even though there was a lot of play at the clinic, there's also a lot of work. So on the right side, the right picture, you see that this is what post-recovery looks like. So when a dog comes out from surgery, this is what we do for them. We make a bed from blankets and towels, clean blankets and towels and we cover them with more blankets and towels because when they come out of surgery, their temperature are low, their heart rate is low because when you put an animal to sleep for surgery, their heart rate drops and their temperature drops. So it's actually not very good for them. So post, 
post-surgery recovery, this is what we do. And sometimes we hook them up to an IV if they're dehydrated. But most of the time, we just try to bring their temperature and heart rate back to normal. And that's what I did a lot of the time. Like, you see in the picture, there's someone sitting down. So for every each patient that's out of recovery, you have to have someone sit down with them. So that's what I did a lot of the time. And sometimes the recovery can take up to three to four hours if their temperature isn't recovering. And I think I sat with that dog, after, like, I think I sat with that dog for about three and a half hours that day. And sitting down may sound easy to you, but it's actually really hard. You have to give the patient full attention, and if it's like back to sleep, you have nothing to do. And sometimes you get dozy, and that did happen to me. And I, as I observed them, I realized that at the clinic, there's a lot of multitasking going on. And I know in school we learn that, oh, like, teachers tell us multitasking doesn't work, it's not productive, but in this work environment, I realized you have to learn how to multitask. Besides multitasking, I also realized that doctors and technicians work really well under pressure. They don't buckle under pressure like the majority of us, I'm sure. And that is something I realized you have to have in order to become an animal doctor or an animal nurse. And as I thought about these things, I realized that this job is more than just, oh, helping animals, helping them be healthy, doing surgeries and stuff. This is, you have to have certain traits like multitasking and um, don't pop up under pressure. And all these things told me that maybe this isn't the right job for me. So the first few weeks as I started interning, there were these two stray cats in the back of the room. They were kind of isolated from the rest of the clinic. They were kept where like extra needles and gauzes are kept, which was my job. My job was to restock the shelves. And every time I go back there, the cats go up to the cages and they rub against the meowing at me. And they're like, oh, let us out. And obviously they want attention and love or they just want to get out of the cage. And I asked the doctors and technicians, like, why can't we let them out? They seem so miserable. And the doctors and technicians had a great answer. They say, we can't let them out because they're strays and we don't know what viruses they have, so we don't want to, you know, put up our patients in harm, in danger, and that was a really good answer. And I realized that there's nothing I can do to help these cats besides ignoring them every time I walk back. 